As a long-time D&D player, I've always considered playing D&D a very family-friendly RPG to play. Minus the long hours of sitting in one spot and having to actually pay attention, D&D I always thought was a game that kids can get into. Then I read this book. I was reminded that there is some horrifying nightmare fuel in D&D, and oh my god, we are a bunch of murder hobos. <laughs> Anyway, this book gets incredibly gory really fast, so I've left out a lot of those details, but if you are wanting to read this book, you have been warned. For those who have played Baldur's Gate the game, there's no new information here. This is really just a novelization of the game itself. Well, the warning's out of the way. Let's start our adventure on the Sword Coast on the road to Candlekeep. We set our adventure with Abdel. Our seven-foot-tall muscle man, who is our protagonist and is our barbarian fighter archetype, and is also the default character for the Baldur's Gate game. I will be referring to Abdel in some sort of muscle reference because the book likes to go into detail on how big and strong he is. Immediately, we start the book with Abdel fighting for his life with his adoptive father, Gorion, a monk from Candlekeep that had he had asked Abdel to come with him on a great mission of importance. While on the journey, there is an ambush of cell swords, or it's that our resident beefcake had worked with. Regardless, Abdel El kills two of them before a crossbowman kills Gorion by shooting him in the eye. Seeing the sight of his father being shot in the head, Abdel goes full rage mode and absolutely massacres the rest of the cell swords. Abdel, once finished, runs to his adoptive father's side, and Gorion gives him his mission, to stop the war that is about to come, and gives him a piece of paper before he dies. We are next introduced to our big bads, Tomoko and her lover Severok, as they are discussing if to keep Severok's brother Abdel alive, and they decide to send a halfling and another agent to intercept him in Nashgal. This is definitely not important, and you should just ignore it. This is also the first of a few cuts to these two, so if it ever feels like I'm jumping around, there's a reason why. We go to Abdel, who really has a lot on his mind. On the piece of paper his adoptive father gave him, there's a prophecy that says, An avatar crisis that the children of the Black Lord must rise up against their siblings, and no matter what their alignment is, it will shape the history of the Sword Coast for centuries to come. And he wonders if this has to do with the mission Gorion asked him to come on with his adoptive mother that he was never told about, or in general, what the hell is going on. So he decides to just sleep on it. This doesn't last, as he hears unnatural screaming coming from a horde of gibberlings coming his way. Abdel, trying not to be detected, eventually is and begins to fight for his life, cutting down gibberlings. Eventually, Abdel gets backed into a granite pillar while still fighting the beasts, but is quickly becoming exhausted. When suddenly, a bright light comes out of nowhere, blinding our big muscle boy, as well as scaring off the gibberlings. Abdel's rescuers turns out to be a scrawny and skittish wizard by the name of Exar, and a halfling named Monteran. And after pre pleasantries are exchanged, they agree to go to Candlelight and find work at the Friendly Arms. This walk turns out to be very awkward, with Exar being a quote-unquote madman that spews out random foreshadowing like, your father is Ball. Okay, so this brings up my first issue with this book, and it's the quote-unquote reveals in the book. This book is only about 250 pages long, and between all the things the author needs to do, such as character development, plot progression, and other things that the author needs to foreshadow that will be a big reveal later on, it isn't given the proper time to be spaced out to be a sly and coy reference that only an attentive reader will catch. While it does seem that I have isolated and highlighted them, I will say that in the book they are as blatant as I am making them out now. There's really only one reveal out of the three that isn't blatantly foreshadowed. Back with the party, Abdel walks into the Friendly Arms, and instead of being a part of a joke, 
he gets a chair thrown at his face. Thankfully for the person who threw the chair at our resident beefcake, he was grabbed by the guards and beaten for his crimes. After a few drinks, we are introduced to two new characters that were supposed to meet Gorion, an Armenian half-elf by the name of Khalid, and his wife Jahira, who is a gorgeous half-elf that makes our thick boy blush. Blushing aside, Abdel explains that his adoptive father had died on the way to meet them, and that's why he needed to meet them in the first place. Our half-elf couple is about to explain when the man from earlier decides throwing a bottle at a seven-foot-tall cousin of Gigantopithecus Blackie was a good idea. Unsurprisingly, Abdel responds with throwing the knife that Gorion gave him at a young age into the man's chest, killing him instantly. Normally, this would be considered murder. However, our creepy mage found out he had actually been pickpocketing everybody this whole time. So really, Abdel actually did everybody a public service. The party decides to promptly leave afterwards before someone realizes the legal flaws in that argument. Seven and a half days later, they make it to Nashgal, and it turns out that they are there to investigate whoever who has been sabotaging the iron mines for both Am and Baldur's Gate, and that has been causing tensions between the two nations. You couldn't really tell, though, as you entered the town, as it seems very lively, even though the mines are not producing any ore. But Abdel does notice that people are very nervous. Then, on their way to the mines, they find a dead body in a field and take the keys off him. At the mines, Exar all of a sudden takes charge and leads them into the mine. When questioned, this leads to tensions to grow in between Exar and Monteran versus Khalid and Jahira with Abdel being caught in the middle, but they decide to move forward, till they find a vial of aluminium which makes iron ore useless. This, for some odd reason, makes everyone draw swords, with Monteran trying to convince Abdel to side with them, which is reinforced with Khalid charging at Abdel before he is able to choose a side. Abdel is the better swordsman, and gets a really good gut slice on Khalid that makes Abdel believes kills him. Jahira, realizing the uneven fight she is in, gets past the three by kicking Abdel in the balls, and after a good head start, the halfling and our protagonist pursue her, with Xar to take up Abdel's knife that had been dropped during the fighting. But even with Monteran's dark vision, they cannot keep up with the half-elf. Right after they stop, they accidentally walk into a cobalt ambush after seeing them sabotage the iron ore. Well, this ambush ends with all but one of the Cobots dying, and is then pursued by our two party members. During this pursuit, Abdel hears Jahira's voice in the distance, and runs to it, only to be pushed into a dark pit by Cobalts. To make things worse, there is a half-orc with a giant club down there to greet him at the bottom of the pit. But for our big muscled hero, who is about the same size, Abdel easily cuts down the half-orc. After this quick bloodbath, Abdel, despite being practically blind, does find Jahira in a cage with another elf. Jahira, in a very surprisingly casual manner, asks if he killed her husband. Abdel, wanting to avoid the most awkward question of all time, decides that finding a way to free her would be a good idea. So, he tries to use one of the keys he had gotten off the dead man on the surface, and surprisingly, the third key works. This, however, only makes Jahira press the matter more, and demands to see her husband. Abdel, being only good for his muscles, has no idea how to navigate the mines, but our new elf friend does. So they make their way back to her husband, who is surprisingly alive. Abdel, for the second time in this mine, finds a solution to his problem on his person with a vial that he had bought earlier. Turns out that instead of being a healing potion or something useful, it was just lilac and honey that still somehow stops the bleeding. Yeah, that sounds just as effective as using essential oils to fix having your stomach cut open by someone who could win the Mr. Universe competition without training. Now, after their new elf friend leads them out of the mines, the elf is then amazed that they were able to get through a field of black lotus flowers that are super deadly 
and that the Zentarim have been using that field to block access to the mine. Now this turns out to not be too much of an issue to Jahira, because it turns out she is actually a druid and can just pray for the flowers to not kill her and the rest of her party. I'm sure you're wondering, what happened to Exar and Monteran? Well, they were captured by their boss, who, surprise surprise, is Severok, who then tortures them, dismembers them, and then cuts the halfling's throat for... failing to not kill slash trying to kill Eptel? Yeah, it isn't really well stated why they were killed, but this leads to one of my biggest issues with the book, which is just they throw away characters. Exar and Monteran are introduced in Chapter 3, and by Chapter 9 they're killed off. Which, how short of a book this is, it really just feels like these characters are just being used to, for one thing, to progress the plot, and then are promptly killed off. And yes, for those who played the games, many of these characters don't die in the game, I know. You guys will see what I mean later. After that, we have a quick time jump to Abdel having a battle with his mortal enemy. Chairs being thrown at his head. It turns out that more cell swords were sent to kill the party. Abdel is convinced to not kill the last young cell sword, which turns out to be a good call, because the guy is incredibly knowledgeable revealing that his employer's name is Tazok, who is currently in Beragost, and is a member of the Iron Throne, who is trying to disrupt the iron trade to cause a war between Am and Baldur's Gate. Abdel pieces together that this must have been what Gorion was trying to prevent, and that Khalid and Jahira know more than they let on. Later that night, Abdel hears someone trying to sneak into his room, and waits until they are close enough for him to strike. And then he punches Jahira in the face. Who, surprise, turns out to be the person who snuck into his room. Now, despite the bloody nose, she does try to explain why she is in there, but emotionally breaks down and runs out the door. <sighs> yeah, this is going to happen a few times, so uh, get used to it. Well, the next morning, everyone notices a battered Jahira, and our elf friend, who reveals his name to be Exxon, believes that her husband was the one that hit her, and Jahira finally tells him to beg it off after Exxon throws a few racial slurs over to her husband. Abdel, wanting to avoid this awkward situation that he has created, decides that he should go find Gorion's body again, and splits up from the rest of the party while they try to find Tazok in Beragost. So Abdel goes to find his father, and it turns out that ghouls have dug up the graves of Gorion, and out of pure rage he begins to try to kill all the ghouls. But it turns out one of the ghouls that escapes Abdel's slaughter is someone that he knew, and someone he went to the funeral of, a man named Korak. Korak explains that he told the other ghouls not to try to eat Gorion, and out of pure frustration, Abdel leaves before he completely loses his anger on his old friend. We then go to the next chapter to see stage 2 of Severok's plan, using an army of doppelgangers to infiltrate society, one of which he orders to transform into Tazok and intercept Abdel's party. Speaking of the party, it's still a super awkward situation because now the married couple is having an incredibly heated argument. It turns out that not only are both the half-elves a part of the Harpers, but ever since they joined, Khalid has been sleeping around with the other Harper members. Then Khalid tries to flip the blame on her, saying that he knows that she has feelings for Abdel and that he's a freak of nature, which she can't disagree with that statement but still sees the good in him. Then Exxon, being the only person who is doing anything productive, from an arm wrestling competition he had with an orc, was able to get the name of Tazok's lieutenant, Tanzik, and that he could lead them to Tazok. Then a messenger comes through the door saying that Abdel is back. Jahira immediately volunteers to check up on him, and Abdel is just not in a good state. 
and even though there's a little bit of sexual tension, neither of them act on it. The next morning, they go to the hotel with horses Abdel was able to acquire from winnings in an arm wrestling competition. After the author describes how amazing Abdel's arms are, Tanzig does eventually leave the hotel, and the party trails him. But things do not go so smoothly for the party as they trail him. While trying to avoid a group of six people that actually turn out to be blob monsters, immediately attack the party once they get in close range. They do manage to kill a few when they realize that Khalid is missing. The party does find him, but inside one of the blobs, half eaten away by acid. Abdel, for the second time, goes for the kill and finishes the job. Our shaken party tries to make up ground and track Tanzig down, which, as they nearly give up, they accidentally almost run into him. Oblivious to the party following him, Tanzig leads them to a camp of an unknown amount of people. So the party debates on what to do. Abdel wants to go blade swinging, Jahira is unsure of the approach, and Exxon, again being the only productive one, says that they don't know how many people there are, and suggests that he silently infiltrates the camp and gathers intel. They agree to it, and as silent as the night, he disappears after receiving a good luck charm bracelet from Jahira. With nothing to do and no other way to keep warm, Jahira snuggles up to Abdel and falls asleep. They wake up the next morning, scared that Exxon isn't back. But don't worry, he shows up and drops the best line to responding on what he had been doing that night. And I quote, Oh, I was just sleeping with a beautiful woman. Oh, wait, that wasn't me. <laughs> God, I love that line. I just love it. But uh, he does come back with really important info, saying that, yes, there is way too many of them for the three of them to kill. But sneaking around, he was able to find a map to the mine the Iron Throne has been using to get their iron to sell to Om um and Baldur's Gate. And he also retrieved a smooth leather book that on further inspection is made of human skin, and needless to say is an evil book that needs to go to Candlekeep as soon as possible. This conversation is interrupted by an eavesdropping bandit that is literally killed within three heartbeats by Abdel. And with his murder lust satisfied and realizing they need a guide to the mine, Abdel decides to drag the body around to attract Korak. This ploy works, and Korak is very enthusiastically willing to help them through the forest. Once they get into the forest, a spider lands on Jahira and decides to crawl into Jahira's shirt. And Abdel thinks the best thing to do is to rip off her shirt and smash the bug, only to realize he's just disrobed her. Okay, well, after that little skit, they march further into the forest and encounter larger and larger spiders. And they feel as if they are being hunted. Okay, so I'm just going to warn y'all now. If you are squeamish or really hate spiders, just avoid all of chapter 16. You won't miss much. Other than Big Zon being killed. Spoilers, by the way. It's okay, he only lasted seven chapters anyway. And then the party makes it to a clearing to see that it is completely filled with spider webs. And there, in the center of this clearing, is a tower of spider webs. And near there is a spider the size of a cow screeching to commence the attack on the party. Out of the bushes come tons of entercaps, half-human, half-spider creatures to swarm the party. Jahira falls over out of pure horror, and Exxon and Abdel are left to fend off the creatures, and f the fighting is bloody, hard, and the enemies never-ending. Abdel then has to fight the large spider that can talk, and only says that he wants to feed on him. While he can barely survive the multiple attacks and the spider webs catching Abdel, he barely manages to cut the spider in two and its guts pour out all over him. Now being stuck in the webs, he can only watch as Ixan finishes off one of his foes. Thinking that they are safe, Abdel yells at him to cut him free. 
only for Exxon to be ambushed out of nowhere by a spider and completely decapitates Exxon. Abdel then frees himself by letting the skin be pulled off and then kills the spider that killed his elf friend. He then hears the screams of Jahira and rushes into the tower. That is when our muscle-bound hero finds out that the tower is actually made of human bodies as the bricks, and the mortar, the spider webs. After cutting a few spider men down, Abdel finally makes his way to the central chamber, and that is where he finds Jahira in a cocoon of webs. He gets her out of the webs, and he sees a creature with a bloated and rotten human female torso attached to a huge larvae of some type, and that half her face is being covered from the skin from the top of her head that had was rotten and fallen off the bone. This poor creature's name is Sentinel, and that she was captured years ago and forced to breed with the spiders to create more of these creatures. She only has one request from Abdel, which is for him to kill her. He does so, and in cutting her open, gets her guts spilled all over him. And then the party leaves this spider hell, and never speak of this scarring experience ever again. Just like me after reading this section. After recovering from their experience and wandering through the forest, they eventually do find the mine they are looking for. They find that slaves of many races are working the mines as well as lots of guards, too many of them for a frontal assault. Abdel figures that they aren't expecting anyone to come from the forest, let alone anyone to sneak around and go into the back entrance. And with the help of some freed slaves, they could possibly take him out that way. And, remarkably, despite some reluctance from the slaves, they are able to kill off all the guards with the help of a dwarf named Yeselik and his gang. After the liberation of the camp, Yeselik explains that the mine is run by a man named Ryaltar, and implies that he is running the Iron Throne. Now, I am sad to say that this is where I have to end the video. I didn't want to make this a multi-part review, but with everything going on in my life and the amount of work already going into this, I had to cut it short so I could try and get the other Mass Effect and Dragon Age books I wanted to do done. I will try to get part two out in a few weeks. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.